I am really excited to be introducing my next guest to you, Skyru. Sky is absolutely amazing. I absolutely love her. And I met her in Australia where she works as a senior cybersecurity specialist in a team called Discovery. Now she works for Australia's largest telecommunications company, Telstra. And Discovery is really unique um, and it's industry leading in terms of its capability because what it does is it helps the business to identify and understand unknown business risks using data. In the evening though, Sky actually does something different. So she actually uses her skills, all of her knowledge and works as a consultant, blogger and mentor. And she is absolutely passionate about helping people improve their lives so that they have an easier time and um, drawing on her own, drawing from her own experiences to help them do that. I'm going to introduce Sky to you right now. I'm going to start with saying welcome, Sky. <laughs> us about how you got into cybersecurity. Where did you start? What was your journey? Hi everyone and thank you Jane for that lovely introduction. Um, my story with cybersecurity probably started when I was in high school. So I'm, I was born in China um, and we migrated to Australia in 1996. And unlike most uh, people from my ethnic background, I'm not very academically inclined, but there was one thing that I enjoyed was playing on the computer. I loved chatting. And through that, I developed a very, very fast touch typing skill. So I thought, you know what, how wonderful would it be if I could get into a career using computers? Um, so, so I took a course in Bachelors of Information Systems and throughout the course, I found that I didn't really enjoy it until my final year where by chance I selected an elective called Organizational Information Security and I absolutely loved that unit. I particularly fell in love with the digital forensics or computer forensics component. And I'd made up my mind that I would get a job working as a forensic analyst for the Victoria police. And so, wow. yeah. And so that really began my journey. Um, I spoke with career advisors and lecturers. My lecturer was the first person to advise that if you do want a career in forensics, working for law enforcement is the best way to start because I would learn a lot of the really great habits from detectives. That's really and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so he, he suggested that I try to get a job working with law enforcement. Um, but the career advisor was a little less, less encouraging. He suggests, he said that um, it is a very male dominated industry. And given that my academic scores didn't show that I was an exemplary, an exemplary student, I should perhaps reconsider my options. Really? Wow. Yes. Yeah. So I, I walked away from that conversation more than determined more than ever that I was on the right path. So mm -hmm. I actually got a job working in the data center at the Victoria Police as a data entry operator, processing police reports, taking calls. Um, and I thought I would get a job working at the Victoria Police and I would network, talk to people, educate myself and wait for the right opportunity. And I was really fortunate that about five months after my my role at the data center, um, an opening came up in the computer crime squad as it was known then. Um, and, I, and I applied for that position. So the rest is kind of history. And that, and that was my, my first opening role into, into the cybersecurity industry. So, so it wasn't as hard as he made out. You know, it, 
I mean, it, it almost sounds like he was trying to put you off from actually going into, do you think he was trying to put you off actually? Or do you think he was actually just trying to be fair and to, to say, this is what it's like, I'm gonna prepare you, you know, think really carefully about it. What do you think, why, why would he say something like that? I, I think, I think part, part, partly, I, I, don't, I don't think he gave me the suggestion to be malicious. I, I think to him, he actually thought that he was being kind because it was challenging. I was the only female with the Computer Crime Squad when I first started for at least 12 months before we hired a second female analyst. And at the, at the beginning of my career, uh, when we went to training courses, I was always the only female participant, but I, but I was, I, I think I was one of the very fortunate people to have very, very supportive colleagues. And I learned a lot from my colleagues. I was extremely untechnical when I first started working. I would never cracked open a computer, never seen the insides of a computer. And my job was to wow. remove computer hard drives or um, elect hard drives, memory storage from electronic devices. And, I, and I'd never done that before. So um, for anyone out there who believe, who thinks that, oh, I'm not technical enough to get, get into this industry, I, I did it. You can do it too. Just go into it with an open mind. So I, I learned a lot from my colleagues in my, in my first role working at the Victoria Police. Did it bother you? Did it bother you? Did you even notice? that you are like the only woman that, I mean, it's, I know that sounds really silly, but for much of my career, I didn't really even notice, you know, I just kind of, it was normal, it was so normal. I didn't really even notice that I wasn't really one of the few women, you know, in you know, doing my job or in a certain environment. Do, were you very conscious of that or was it just like, okay, well, yeah, there aren't really any many women, but it doesn't really bother me and let's just get on with the job. How did that make you feel? I actually, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm a bit like you. I, I never noticed it unless mm. someone else raised it. Yes. So yes. I never really thought about it um, unless someone else said, oh, what's it like to be the only woman in, in the room? And I thought, oh, what do you mean? Oh, wait, I am the only female yes. in the office. So um, I, I think much of that, was probably to the credit of my colleagues at the time as well. They just made me feel very, very welcomed. And I was just a part of the family. So I never, they never gave me a reason to feel yeah. I wasn't one of them. Yeah. And, and from the sounds of it, it didn't feel, well, did it feel like you had to become one of the guys? Cause I know sometimes it can, it can be like that, you know, with the kind of culture sometimes that can be the drinking culture you know after work and things like that or the banter in the office and things like that did you have to did you have to become one of the guys or were you able to be you i was able to be me which, yeah. which i'm really really grateful for now that thinking back that that being my very first job out of university i was yeah. able to be myself and the guys really looked out for me that's great. That's what I thought. I didn't want to. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. So what happened, you know, after, after that, you know, after you kind of like did your forensics, you know, with the Victorian police? Um, so I was at the Victoria police for about, uh, for over two years mm -hmm. and it got to the point where I started to realize that I wanted to push myself a little bit further. Um, and one of the for my, my former colleagues had left and gone into consulting. So he rang me one day and said, look, I know, I know you're young, you're motivated and you're ambitious. Do you want to have a go at working consulting? And I thought, why not? I, I would still be doing forensics um, for a different company. And I would also learn what it would be like to work in the private sector, working for clients. And so, and so was that a consultancy that you, or was it, it, it wasn't Telstra, presumably? No, it wasn't. It was um, one of the large consulting firms. And so what was that like for you? Can you describe kind of your experience there was, you know, what was it like? Um, working in a large consulting firm was a really big culture shock for me. 
Yeah. Because um, working at the police, it was a very, very laid back kind of attitude. Whereas um, when you're working in a consulting firm, you kind of, you, you need to be a lot more professional. Um, particularly yeah. what I found was a big shock for me was the way I communicated with my clients. So I really, right. I really felt that I needed to tailor my communication to my clients because not everyone wants details. Whereas yes. when I was working at the police, it was all about the details. So I had to take very comprehensive notes. Um, my court statements would, in, would essentially incorporate every single step that I took, technical as well as my analysis notes. Uh, but when I'm working for a client, I couldn't adopt the same kind of reporting communication methodology. Yes. I remember there was an instance where my manager made me rewrite my email three times because I was being too comprehensive. And he said, think about your audience. Yes. Think about who they are. Think about how much time they potentially would have in their day and yes. then write this email. Right. Well, that's really interesting, isn't it? So they did. So, so you were very much supported when you went there and, and guided and they, they gave you that a steerage really in terms of how you were communicating yes absolutely yeah wow incredible and what else did you kind of what else were the noticeable differences for you i realized that there was a huge mindset shift yeah. so um, when i was working at the victoria police um the material the, the, the graphical material that i would be exposed to um was pretty disturbing. So that set my so that set my baseline a little off a, a little off kilter compared to yeah. someone else. So yeah. um, one part of my role was to actually complete monthly internet reporting for a client when I was in consulting. And I remember one of our colleagues actually said, um, "Is anyone here? Um, would you do you have any sensitivity to?" graphical material because that could happen yes um, when we're looking at internet history reviewing what they were looking at yeah and I found it strange that people around me raised their hand whereas I kind of just sat back and went oh I'm I'm, I'm happy wow. I can <laughs> I can do it <laughs> because because of having come from the police and being yeah. exposed to wow yeah, because for me, that was really quite normal. It was just like, well, this is just really normal for me. And to be even asked that, was that, you know, like, what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I thought that it was strange that they were being so careful with it. Yes. Um, yeah, because it was normal to me. And there, there was another instance where I was processing a large batch of um, data collected from a client for a, um, for a litigation. Um, I found that there was a video with inappropriate images embedded yeah. in another file. And I, I looked at it. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is no big deal. Thinking, well, this isn't illegal without yes. knowing that, hang on a minute, there's corporate policy. What's acceptable in the corporate world is very different to whether or not something is legal or illegal. Some people could lose their jobs. So yeah. I didn't even think to make a big deal about it and talk to my chain of command. I thought that I was already going above and beyond by just sending an email to my counterpart on the client side saying, hey, we're about to send you another delivery and there's this video here, just be careful. Wow. And I got wow. into so much trouble because when my manager went to have a meeting with the client, the, the client were, they, they freaked out. So they were like, we, we need to take serious action against this person. And they wanted more information. And my manager didn't have that detail because I, I didn't tell him because I, I just thought that that was, that, that was normal. Wow. Wow. So a great learning experience for you. Absolutely. Very, very big learning experience for me was, wow. um, just understanding the cultural differences between the companies and what's what's acceptable. I was going to ask about the cultural differences. I mean, what you know, what was that like? Was it really fast paced? Was it high pressure? Because often, often certainly in some of the, the 
the bigger organizations and particularly I think some of the consultancies, it can be high pressure and sometimes low support. So sometimes you're thrown in at the deep end and it's like make of, make of this, m make this job your own. Um, what was it like for you? For me, it was, it was a mixture. So I felt that throughout, throughout my career, I've kind of always jumped into the deep end yeah. and I've chosen to swim. Um, I did, I was quite fortunate that one of my manager at the time was also ex Victoria police. Oh, okay. That's really, um, so we were able to support each other quite a bit and yeah. the, and the culture was quite supportive, which mm -hmm. was nice. So I also learned a lot from my colleagues, but you're right in that there, there, there was also a lot of very long hours. Um, and from time to time, I would feel like I couldn't go in terms of my analysis. I couldn't go as in depth because there's client deadlines, there's yes. expectations, but there's also the budget limitations. Yes. I yeah. I, I had to learn that, um, the kind of full or comprehensive forensic analysis that I used to be able to do work for when I was working for law enforcement, I couldn't do to the same level when I'm working in, in a consultancy because you're, it's my time is money and many clients wouldn't be willing to pay that much money for a full analysis. Interesting. Interesting. So did you, what else happened at the consultancies? Did you just, focus on the forensic side of things or did you get more exposure into other areas? Um, so in the consultancy I started working in e-discovery as well so e-discovery is essentially the process of um, helping my client to identify what data um, where the data stored at um, collection processing and then delivery of that data to a law firm um, for the purpose of litigation or a regular a regulator investigation so um that was very interesting for me um because i got to learn a lot about how companies actually managed their information mm. yes and presumably we are looking at a whole variety of different types of <clears throat> of companies you know in terms of size and um industry and sector and things like that as well yes so um at the at the time my main client was a large resource natural resources sorry yeah. at the time my main client was a um, large natural resources company but they were also small to medium um, organization um, clients as well did you notice did you notice any patterns you know, with I love patterns and trends and things like that. Did you notice any patterns and trends, you know, with those organizations that you're working with? I, I noticed that there was a, um, I always thought that in my mind that the large, larger companies, the companies with better resources would be much better at managing their information. Yes. Or managing their data. I realized that I was actually wrong. That's it's actually very much driven by the culture and by the leadership. Right. So I've worked for, um, so I've, I've helped a large and also a small client because their management or their leadership was very focused on ensuring that um, they had, that their data was properly managed. That yes. it made my job a lot easier. But for some organizations, um, they could be equally as large it was not so much the case. Yeah. But one thing I did find that is that um, for companies that are in industries that are highly regulated, they tended to be a lot better at managing their information and their data. Good. So, so it's almost like because they have to, because they are checked, because they are a regulated firm, um, then they, they have to do that. Whereas given the, you know, given the freedom, they will, from, from what you're saying is, you know, given the freedom, they won't always do that. So in terms of best practice and things like that, um, having that regulation enforces and makes sure that they, they, they do that. Yes. Yeah. 
it's quite it's quite disappointing in some ways but i guess it all comes back to the awareness and also the the commerciality so from, from a business perspective it's just like is this needed um do we do it are we aware of it um and, and so forth yeah i think it's it's quite common because um even if, if i if i think in terms of myself mm. if i had the choice to i would eat junk food all day and not really care about my health but there are side effects to that um so then if if it comes with certain consequences then i know that i can't actually do that i need to lead a healthier life i need to exercise i need to look after what i eat um things like that i think that's quite similar to organizations so in industries where there may not be as much regulation so it's very much up to the individual organization's leadership to make a stand and say this is important to me what whereas other organizations they may not have that awareness like yeah. you said and and also it's the impact isn't it it's just yeah. like well why does it matter you know, so if they don't feel why it matters, you know, and the implications, then they're not necessarily going to do something about it unless they are being checked or they have a manager who says this is best practice or they are regulated and it's, you know, it's, it's part of doing business. Yeah, absolutely. So what happened after the consultancy, after you worked there, how did you, how did you kind of move on? Um, so I worked at a, um, I worked at the large consultancy and then I moved to a boutique consulting firm, um, focused very much on e-discovery. And then from there, I moved, um, to Telstra because I started to feel like working in investigations, in e-discovery, um, working in responding to incidents. I'd, I'd been doing that for around just under 10 years at that point. And I started to feel a little bit drained at always responding after the fact. Yes. So when a former colleague came to me and said, um, do you want to come and work at Telstra? I'm starting this team called open source intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's about um, going to look for, company data or any information that is in the public domain that could be of use to the organization. So I was really interested in that because it started to become more of a proactive exactly. yeah. Um, yeah, aspect. And I, and I thought, you know what, how wonderful would it be to actually be on the side to be able to prevent yes. problems from happening in the first place. But so, so incredibly useful that you had been dealing with the after aftermath, you know, the forensic side. So then to be propelled into that proactivity and it's just like, let's go and let's go and let's go and do this. Cause that had, had you heard of anything like that, you know, happening anywhere else because it's, this is it. I haven't really heard of, of that. No, I, I before I'm um, speaking to my colleague, uh, Dave, I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning his name. Um, <laughs> I hadn't heard about any kind of proactive initiatives. Yeah. Um, so working in open source intelligence for me was reverse e-discovery. Exactly. So I was still going out there to collect data. Uh, and then it was just a matter of how do I refine that data so I can turn that into actionable intelligence for the organization, the organization could consume. Yes. Yeah, so that they, they know their risks and they can see the threats. Yeah, and then, and then after being um, in that division for about two years, um, Chris, who you also know, my boss, came to me and said, um, do you want to have a go at helping set up the discovery team? Um, it's a data-driven capability. We want to look for unknown unknowns yeah. within the data. And I thought... What are you talking about? Yes. What are, what are you talking? I didn't, I really didn't, I couldn't grasp the concept of finding anomalies within the data without knowing what I was looking for in the first place. Yes. yes. So I, I, I always, I, I just kept on asking myself, how the hell do you find something without knowing what you were looking for in the first place? Yes. 
But yeah. I thought, you know what? I'll give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, what did you discover? Because, I mean, that's an absolutely fair question. It's a, it's a smart question to ask. How do you know? I realised that um, the way I was thinking about that problem was wrong. It was not so much about how do I know when there is an anomaly within the data. It was more about understanding what's actually normal. Yes. Yeah. For the data. So, baselining up. Yeah. And at first I came in with the mindset of if we have a whole bunch of data, if we have the right tool, magic will happen. Yes. And I was very wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Because what I didn't realize was we don't have true artificial intelligence. Machines are better at calculating, but yes. you need to tell it what to calculate yes. first. So then I took a very different approach. It was very much um, just doing very simple kind of query, asking very simple questions of the data to let the data tell me what I need to yeah. worry about. So I would ask it questions like, um, over the past week, who are my most active users? Mm -hmm. And I would get my list of users and I would go, is this normal for this user? Yes, it yeah. is. Is this normal, normal for this user? It's not. Okay, let me set that aside. I will look into why that's not normal. Yes. And I found that approaching the problem that way, I was actually able to gain a lot more valuable outputs. Yes. See, I love, I love that because again, it comes down to this whole, you know, for me, I think of security as being, you know, yes, it's all about risk and lowering the risk in line with the business's appetite for it or organization's appetite for it. But it's really about better decision-making and, and with the with AI, just as you said, we're not there with AI. We've still got a long, long way to, way to go. Machine learning is is great too, but again, we are only really at the beginnings of you know both of these um, tools. So for us, it comes it comes down to using our brains. You know, actually thinking uh, thinking more and actually using them. And I know that sounds really obvious, but what I find is so many people are waiting for permission. So many people um, are consuming and not engaging their brains, or they're not allowed to, or they're afraid to. And so with what you're doing, it comes back to <laughs> engage your brain, think outside of the box, um, use your creative thinking and your problem solving, and in order to to move forward and and really you know what you're also doing is you are safeguarding safeguarding yourself and your job and your career and actually getting it ready for well, getting it ready for the now but certainly for the future you know so it's like asking the questions thinking outside of the box how can we looking for the answers as opposed to just sitting complacently and um you know, either using a tool, directing a tool, um, but, but being more of a consumer of, of that tool or robotic in your ways, as opposed to, I have a brain, I have a good brain, I'm going to exercise, you know, my, my thinking, my creative thinking. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, but it is. And, and that's certainly the way that things are going to go. You know, technology is, is here. It's developing fast. You know, we've, we've seen speed, but we've not seen the speed that is going to come. And I, I'm excited for that because of the advancements that are coming. It's fun. But we have to, these machines are, are, are made by people for people. So they're only going to be better when we have the thinking behind them. The thinking behind them in terms of the programming, the designing, the engineering, the programming, and then also the application, just like you're doing. And, and I think another aspect of that is doing discovery has been a really great journey for me to understand what the organization actually needs. So yeah. I actually 
I started to blog about my discovery journey and I, and I called it find your truth because for different organizations, if they decide to adopt the discovery methodology, the truth that you will find from your data from organization to organization is going to be tailored very specifically to that company. So yeah. first of all, it's very fluid and it's easily a, adaptable and it can be adopted. You're not, um, you know, having to rely on any piece of expensive tool. So it's not like I need to, in, I need to purchase this tool that is hundreds of thousands of dollars implemented, um, pay people to look at it. I'm dealing with assets that I already have. So yes. you, can, you can look at your data using Excel mm -hmm. if you want to, which comes with Office. So if you have Windows, you can do this. Um, and, and I also find that um, it's been very educational for me to actually understand various aspects of the organization mm. and things that in the past I probably would not have paid attention to, but then understanding what the implication of certain activities are, even though they may not result in a security incident, for example, but yeah. if that type of behavior, if that type of activity is allowed to happen undetected or unquestioned, it would have a security impact down the track. All you need is for someone to perform the same action with a different intent. So, so you're looking for the vulnerabilities within the data? Um, I wouldn't say for vulnerabilities, um, but it, it could be a potential outcome that okay. we, we could potentially find that there's a vulnerability in, um, in a particular system or um, there is an area or um, there could be detections that we're not looking at. So one of our, our controls may not be detecting certain types of activities, for example. Or maybe allowing it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, about two years ago, I gave a presentation at a conference where I shared an example of a um, employee who was found to be um, running a personal VPN service. So a personal tunnel on their work computer funneling yeah. about 95% of their internet traffic. And that um, but it was through discovery we were able to find it because their internet activity was so different to yeah. um, to someone else. We, we were able to find that as an, as an anomaly. And after my talk, I actually had a couple of the audience members who came up and spoke to me and they said, um, you know, the example that you gave, they actually had an instance of that where it was detected yeah. Unfortunately, the analyst who was investigating that just discarded it as a potential bug or it was normal. They, for whatever reason, they didn't follow through on their analysis. Yeah. And what ended up happening was it became a litigation because something bad actually did happen as a result of that activity. Um, and that was, I guess, one of the things that planted the seed for me to want to help educate people on adopting this analysis process um, that I will be um, teaching as a part of your mentoring platform exactly. um, yeah. is to help minimize that though those kinds of instances occurring. I, I can't I can't promise that it's foolproof. I've yes. made mistakes in my career and I've missed things, but if we have a process, it does help us to reduce those kinds of outcomes. This is it. And also working in a team as well. So it's, you know, if, if it's just you, yes, we're only human. So we do make mistakes and we have good days and bad days and we can't get it right the whole time, but certainly working in a team, that's where, you know, your, your yeah. back should be covered. You know, you've got other people around you too to uh, question your thinking, improve your thinking, to spot things that you may not have, you know, spotted or thought about and things like that. Is that right? Yeah, ab absolutely right. Um, I have a 
colleague of mine, him, he, he and I approach problems very differently. Yeah. Um, and he is absolutely brilliant. I love it when he critiques my work because he's very, very factual and he just tells it to me like it is. And I've learned a lot from him. Um, so we, we can have a banter, have a discussion and talk out a problem. Yes. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's really great. I, I rely on him a lot. Yeah. So it's, I mean, that, that whole kind of like the differences can be challenging. It can feel uncomfortable. Sometimes it can be awkward. It can be irritating, but if you know, this is from, from my opinion anyway, if you know that, um, you know, you're part of a team, you're working together for the good of the organization, for civilization, even whatever it is, you know, if your kind of mission is, is aligned, then it allows you to be different and to tolerate, to tolerate one another and actually to have in most cases, um, fun from it. It's just like, wow, I learned a lot or okay, you irritate me. I'm not saying he does at all, but you know, certainly in my experience, you know, I've had people who irritate me <laughs> and frustrate me, but I value them so much. It's just, that's just my problem because their difference uh, may be so polar to, to mine, but I value them so, so much, but it's, I still might have an irritation with them that I have to deal with. I, I absolutely know what you mean. So I have um, people that I go to that I trust to critique my work, even though I feel like a complete idiot when they rip it apart. But I realize that they're doing it to help me yes. and I'm doing it consciously to help myself and it's nothing personal. Yeah. So tell me about, tell me about, you know, at the very beginning I said, you know, by day sky is this, by night sky is that. Tell me about your blogging. Tell me about your mentoring. Um, uh, wow. It all happened very suddenly. So um, I, for, a, for a while I had been um, mentoring women in uh, the either graduates or yeah. about to graduate university. Um, and I met Jackie Lusto, who you also know at industry events. Um, yeah. and she asked me to become an industry advisor to the Australian women in security network cadets yeah. program. So helping early entry cyber, cyber security women and also university students who are interested in a career in cyber security to connect them with mentors, find them, um, teachers essentially to run hands-on workshops or informative workshops that gives them a very realistic view of what the industry is like yeah. and what various career opportunities are out there. And that really started my mentoring journey. Yeah. Um, and I, and I thought this is, I, I felt that I wanted to help women in disadvantaged place um disadvantage experience um sorry i wanted to help sorry like socioeconomic you know yeah. so those poorer backgrounds you know not not privileged in in any capacity yeah so i wanted to help women experiencing disadvantage in various stages of their life so yeah. i applied to become a mentor through a charity in australia called fitted for work Yes. Um, and they help women to find jobs or get back into the workforce. And that's been a very valuable experience. I actually find through mentoring, I'm yeah. learning a lot from my mentees. Yes. And it's teaching me a lot of gratitude to be grateful for what I have. Yes. And it's made me want to give back more. Yes. And so that kind of kicked off this conversation I was having with, an, um, with another colleague of mine around knowledge sharing. Yeah. Because I felt, I felt very fortunate to have worked with detectives very, very early on in my career. So I have developed a lot of really good habits that I've started noticing that unless you've had the same experience, people probably don't have or they haven't been able to develop as early on. Yeah. And I thought I can mentor people one-on-one -on -one, or I can find a way to broadcast that 
yes. knowledge. And I'm very yeah. passionate about discovery and what we do. And I just feel like more people should be doing this. Yes. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to start blog about it. <laughs> I'm going and your books are great. You know, and I think, you know, I think back to probably the first time that we met and, you know, it doesn't seem like that long ago and you were really just starting your journey on the speaking circuit. Yes. Don't you remember? I mean, it was, was just, you know, and I was there kind of like, prop, not propping you up, but pushing you forward. You can do it. You're going to be great. I think I remember your first one actually that you were, you were doing a workshop. I remember your workshop. Yes. And you know, it doesn't seem like that long ago and you've come so far and that in each little step, it's just like, okay, speaking, workshopping, now blogging and all of those things. And that, that has been, as is usually the case, a very fast journey. It doesn't take long. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's been a crazy whirlwind journey. Everything's happened so fast. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's it's been crazy. So I, I've started um, consulting with a university in Melbourne as well to yeah. be, become an industry advisor to help with their coursework and other projects, basically to help them um, understand the industry a little better. Um, yeah, basically to just help help them out. And I love helping people. I, I know I know it sounds corny, but I I find that I'm I become very happy myself if I know that I'm I am being helpful. It's that contribution, isn't it? Yes. You know, I think Tony Robbins talks about six universal needs and contribution is is one of them. So we don't all need as people all of these six universal needs. But the more we have, the happier that we are are going to be, even though happiness is is certainly a decision that you make rather than wait for it to happen. You know, so contribution is is so worthwhile and brings so much joy. It really does. Yeah, it does. So you are going to be speaking. Um, you're going to be, I was going to say not speaking, but you are going to be training on um, discovery and Tell us a little bit about, about that, what you're going to be doing, you know, when you come to the mentoring platform, um, the secret, the secret code, which is just for women. Um, tell us what you're going to be doing on that. Um, so for, as a part of the module that I have developed, um, journey to discovery, what I will be sharing is proven methodologies for what I'm calling structured and unstructured investigations. Um, and those methodologies will help the attendees to produce analysis outcomes that are first of all repeatable and they can with, withstand scrutiny. Um, so that's from my days of when I would do my analysis, present my findings, and then essentially having to defend my findings in court. Amazing, amazing. Um, and I will also be taking the um, attendees through various scenarios I have experienced and learned from throughout my career. And that, and this knowledge can be applied across multiple disciplines and industries as were, as were my clients were um, from um, throughout my career. And the scenarios that I will be sharing will also include cases or projects that I worked on um, when I worked for law enforcement and yeah. also investigations and incidents that I had worked on as a part of my um, career in consulting. Amazing, amazing, incredible. So where can people tell, I mean, aside from coming onto the platform, which um, is called The Secret Code and you'll find all the details about it, um, you know, either in the show notes or, you know, in the, um, comments underneath the video and things like that there'll be a link somewhere we'll we'll, we'll do that um, but where can people find out about you so where can they go and you know access your blog uh, be mentored by you if they if they want to come and do that where, where can they go sky go to www.skywoo.com that's where my blog is and you can find um, stories that I have to share around my discovery journey, as well as 
what I'm calling the hot chocolates and chit chat section where I share some of my life journey, how I deal with stress. Um, I'll be sharing just through a more casual laid back conversation. I, yeah. I realized that a lot of my experiences, um, people have the same type, types of experiences. Yeah. And as I'm mentoring more and more women in the industry, yeah. people are saying, when I talk to you, I'm finding that I'm slowly changing my mindset. So I thought, you know what? I may as well put everything out there. If, uh, if even if one person can read one of my blog and say, that's helped me. Yes. That's perfect. That's so good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sky. Thank you.